Hey Future Unnaturalists, I'm Emily. And I'm Andy. And we are the hosts of Unnatural, a true crime podcast. Each week, we'll dive into some of the most unnerving crimes that this unnatural world has to offer. Listen for Unnatural on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, make good choices. And don't get got. Bye. I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. Thanks for joining me again. You guys, this podcast is so close to hitting 20,000 downloads. I'm just, like, amazed. So thank you so much for all the support, and um, keep telling your friends. I appreciate it. Today's episode is about Lou Pearlman. Lou Pearlman was the record producer who created boy bands like Backstreet Boys, LFO, and NSYNC before he conned them out of most of their money. He also defrauded banks and investors out of, like, half a billion dollars. And he's also been accused of sexual misconduct towards some of the teen boys that he worked with. My main sources for this episode are the documentary The Boy Band Con, The Lou Pearlman Story, and also a Vanity Fair article from 2007 called Mad About the Boys. Lou Pearlman was born in 1954 and grew up in Flushing, Queens. He really liked blimps growing up. And by his 20s, he started a business where he would buy old blimps or helicopters or jets and flip them, kind of like how people would flip houses. And then he would lease them out like a taxi or an Uber system. His goal with the blimps was to use them for advertising purposes. So, for example, he convinced Jordache Jeans to hire him and use one of his blimps. And they painted the whole thing gold and just painted Jordache on it. Unfortunately, Lou didn't actually have a blimp or the money to buy one. So instead, he purchased a balloon envelope from a guy in California, and he hired an aluminum contractor to build a frame for it at a naval base in Lakehurst, New Jersey. Coincidentally, this base was the same place where the German Zeppelin Hindenburg crashed into flames in 1937. So the blimp that he was leasing out to Jordache, it took off on its inaugural flight on October 8, 1980, and it made it less than a mile before losing altitude, and the pilot was forced to crash land in a garbage dump. Those close to Lou said that he never actually intended to fly the blimp. I mean. It was supposed to take practice runs required under federal law, but he didn't do anywhere near that. But Lou had insured the blimp for the inflated cost of a new blimp, so he ended up being awarded $2.5 million from the insurance company. So he used that money to finance more aircraft and continue his business. He starts building a reputation and, like, funding his lifestyle, taking investors out to dinner and, like, paying every tab to show off, hiring private jets and helicopters for every business trip. Every meal he had had a dozen people on the company's tab. And this is how he got investors to believe in him and his company. Lou also protected himself by hiring inexperienced people, people that didn't know anything about the business. So no matter what decision he made, nobody ever questioned it because they didn't know any better. So multiple businessmen and celebrities started chartering his planes, and this included the band New Kids on the Block. When Lou found out that they were making so much money, he was like, I'm in the wrong business. And he literally just switched careers. In 1992, Lou placed an ad in the newspaper announcing auditions for teenage boys to form a band. Again, he's not like a known name in the music business. He's just this guy who charters planes. But he puts out an ad and people started showing up. One of the first people to contact him was the mother of A.J. McLean. A.J. was 15 years old and he would become the first member of the Backstreet Boys. Hundreds of teenage boys went to audition at Lou's home or at his hangar in Kissimmee in 1992 to 1993. Eventually, four boys were chosen. Brian Luttrell, who was 17 years old, Nick Carter, who was only 13, Kevin Richardson, who was 21, and Howie Duro, who was 15. So they all went to Lou's home and they sang a song together and they instantly sounded fantastic. Perlman came up with the name The Backstreet Boys after Orlando's Backstreet Flea Market. The Backstreet Boys performed their first show at SeaWorld in 1993, and then they headed on tour at amusement parks and malls. They were performing like six, seven days a week, spending 18-hour days rehearsing and performing. Within a year, they had a deal with Jive Records. Their first single was ignored in the U.S., but their first album became a smash hit in Europe. Throughout all of this, Lou would act as a father figure to the boys and tell them that they were all a family. He urged them to call him Big Papa. 
Before the Backstreet Boys really found success in the U.S., Lou decided to start a second group. So Chris Kirkpatrick, J.C. Chavez, and Justin Timberlake got together to try to form a boy band. They were then joined by Joey Fatone and then finally Lance Bass. Uh, by the way, the documentary, The Boy Band Con, it was produced by Lance Bass. He was from NSYNC, obviously. And he describes this experience where he was just, like, instantly receiving red carpet treatment. He was picked up at the airport in a Rolls Royce, which he's never seen one in person before. And when he got to Lou's home, all the boys were there, and they sang the Star Spangled Banner together. And as soon as they finished, they just looked around at each other with their jaws dropped. They high-fived each other, and they were like, holy crap. Like, Lance came in, and now they're a band. Their band is complete. This was it. It was amazing. Lou told the NSYNC boys that he wanted to get a house for all the boys to live in together so that they would be able to rehearse and not have to worry about work or school because all of their tutoring and their lessons could be done from home. NSYNC was constantly training and rehearsing. While the Backstreet Boys were out performing, they were really being known for their singing and their harmony. So NSYNC was trying to become known for their overall performance and their choreographies. Both the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC were spending all of their time working, but Lou made life seem like a dream. He would take them to fancy restaurants and then on trips in private jets. And these boys were like teenagers or like super young adults, so they just couldn't fathom the kind of success that Lou appeared to have. I mean, he made the guys feel important. He told them they were stars. When the Backstreet Boys finally got their success in the United States, it was unstoppable. MTV made shows like TRL where stars like the boy bands would appear and the fans went insane. They had singles all over the charts and they were selling out all of their concerts. Lou wasn't ready to present NSYNC yet, so they kind of started feeling like the redheaded stepchild. They worked as hard as they could just to get even like a foot in the door. So one day the Backstreet Boys were offered a gig for Disney, but the guys were absolutely burnt out, so they turned the job down. And Sync, however, was happy to take their sloppy second, so they took the job, and that Disney special changed everything. And Sync blew up, and now they were in the competition with the Backstreet Boys. Of course, this was a huge conflict of interest because they had the same manager. And worse yet, Lou would pin them against each other. He would like tell each band, "Oh, I can't believe the Backstreet Boys are telling are doing this," or "And Sync said this about you, and I I can't believe they're not listening to me." He was stirring up the drama between the two bands. He was in inventing it, really. So the band members would see each other often, and it was really uncomfortable. They were constantly worrying about the other band confronting them or, like, coming up and throwing a punch or something. When the boys finally get their first paycheck, it was devastating. Lance Bass says that he only received a $10,000 check. Even though he had been working 18-hour days and touring, and touring for months... It wasn't even minimum wage. Like, they could have made more money working at a fast food place. But somehow, Lou was making millions. So Lance went back to the hotel and ripped up his paycheck, and the guys contacted a lawyer, and the lawyer was basically like, this is one of the worst contracts I've ever seen in music history. You need to get out of this. Apparently, Lou had made himself the sixth member of NSYNC, meaning that he was making the same amount as all the other guys for doing none of the work. This was also the moment that the boys learned the word recoupable. Essentially, what they learned was that they were actually the ones paying for all the fancy dinners and the flights and the marketing and the bills for their home, all the things that they were thanking Lou for. Plus, they were paying Lou a sixth of their salaries and buying his dinners and his flights and shit, so he was literally stealing from them. The NSYNC guys were absolutely livid, and their mothers felt so guilty they wanted to kill Lou. At this point, everybody saw Lou as family, so... Everybody and their mamas confronted him. Lou felt that he was entitled to everything he had taken. The boys were absolutely shook. Lou completely flipped a switch on them. He was super charming and acting like a father figure. And now he was this entitled narcissist who was like, I absolutely deserve 90%. So do you want the 10% or do you want nothing? So NSYNC decided to file a lawsuit in 1999. And when Lou got word of their plan, he sued them. He sued them for the name NSYNC, saying that he was NSYNC. So now the guys are at risk of losing their label after all the work they had put in. Fortunately, the judge was like, you're trying to tell me that you're in sync and these guys who like, my daughter has a poster of them in her room. You're telling me they're not in sync. I don't know who the fuck you are, but I've seen them. So she sided with NSYNC and they got out of their contract. With the Backstreet Boys, it went a little bit differently. They had actually put some money aside and just paid Lou to get the fuck out of their lives. 
Upon their release from their contract, NSYNC became really pumped about producing a new album of their own, their first album without Lou. Thus was born No Strings Attached, which is literally about severing their ties to Lou. The song Bye 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 has been thought to be about a breakup, but it's actually about their separation from Lou Pearlman. So even though there were rumors about what was going on with the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and Lou taking all of their money, he still had quite a reputation and more and more teenagers started flocking to audition for him. In the year 2000, Lou created the show Making the Band. The first season focused on the band O-Town. O-Town was a band that he was like constantly promising to people like, hey, you know, if you stick with me, you might be in O-Town one day. He was like hanging this over people, which reminds me a lot of Dan Schneider <laughs> promising shows to kids. And there weren't just boy bands. There was also a girl band called Innocence, which this was actually the first band that Britney Spears was in. And they struggled with similar issues where they were aware that their contracts were garbage, but they were hopeful that they would eventually become big names anyway. But as it turns out, the financial manipulation wasn't the only misconduct that these teens experienced from Lou. Rich Cronin, the lead singer from LFO, told this story about Lou. He says that Lou approached him and said something like, I have a big opportunity for you guys in Europe. This could be the make it or break it moment for LFO. This guy in Europe could be what you guys are looking for. All he wants to do is touch your penis. That's just how they do business over there. We can't blow this deal and I don't want you to get freaked out, so I'll tell you what. I'm going to let you practice on me. He also told Rich that he studied psychology, so like, don't worry, I'll help you get through it, but don't fucking tell anybody. Rich Cronin told the story on Howard Stern, if you want to look it up. Um, I'll put it on the Broken Limelight page. He also said, Honestly, I don't think Lou ever thought we would become stars. I think he just wanted cute guys around him. This was all an excuse. And then lightning crazily stuck and an empire was created. It was all dumb luck. I think his motives for getting into music were very different. Lou also had a tanning bed in his home, and he often encouraged the girls in Innocence to use it. But what they didn't know was that Lou had recording devices in the room, and he would show the boys the videos of the girls getting naked to tan. It's also been rumored that some kind of incident occurred with Nick Carter, who, remember, he was only 13 years old when he started the band, and in 1997, he just turned 17. What exactly happened, though, remains unclear even to the boys in the group. Denise McLean, who's AJ's mom, said, My son did say something about the fact that Nick had been uncomfortable staying at Perlman's house. For a while, Nick loved going over to Lou's house. All of a sudden, it appeared there was a flip at some point. Then we heard from the Carter camp that there was some kind of inappropriate behavior. It was just odd. I can just say that there were odd events that took place. For the record, neither Nick Carter nor his parents will address what, if anything, happened. But Nick's mother, Jane, did refer to Perlman as a sexual predator. She said in an interview, Certain things happened, and it almost destroyed our family. I tried to warn everyone. I tried to warn all the mothers. I tried to expose him for what he was years ago. I hope you expose him because the financial scandal is the least of his injustices. When she was asked why she wouldn't discuss it further, she said that she didn't want to jeopardize her relationship with Nick. She said, I can't say anymore. These children are fearful, and they want to go on with their careers. Now, do you guys remember Nick Carter's younger brother, Aaron Carter? He was also being managed by Perlman. He started performing in 1997 when he was just nine years old. You guys remember that? He was a little little kid singing Aaron's Party and I Want Candy, and then he dated Hilary Duff and then cheated on her with Lindsay Lohan. The, the Carter family is a whole-ass show of its own. In 2002, a lawsuit was filed against Lou by Aaron's parents, alleging that he had failed to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in royalties on Aaron's 1998 album. The suit was settled out of court. What's interesting about this is that Aaron Carter defends Lou with his dying breath. Lance Bass has talked about how he fought to have Aaron appear on the documentary. He thought that, you know, Aaron was one of the youngest who has ever been close to Lou and maybe Aaron would have some stories. But in reality, Aaron shows up crying, just saying that he can't believe anybody would make up these stories about someone like Lou who did so much for all their careers. I'm going to play you a clip of Aaron. I don't know if you guys have seen him in recent years, but he's been going through a lot. So he's been struggling with an eating disorder and drug addiction, and he's also kind of been going back and forth confused about his sexuality. And in my brain, I can't help but think that he's dealing with some childhood trauma, and the way that he defends Lou Pearlman looks and sounds a lot like Stockholm Syndrome. Again, I'm not a mental health professional, but take a listen for yourself. My opinion of Lou being a sexual predator is that that is not true. 
That is so foul. He would come up to you and he'd teach you how to do push-ups. He taught me how to do diamond push-ups so I could build my chest. And he's a pedophile? Uh, yeah. That sounds exactly like he's grooming you, Aaron. Shut up about that, guys. Aaron completely denies that Lou ever recorded anything at his house, even though literally everyone else said that you could see cameras all over his home and, like, Everybody knew that he had a control room in his bedroom where he could, like, see everything. But Aaron's like, Oh, 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 right, right. Where's that footage? Why didn't she see him? Exactly. Because it's all lies. I went in that tanning bed all the time. My mom did, too. She searched through it before she would let me go through it for cameras. So did my dad. Interestingly, Aaron Carter also hung out with Michael Jackson as a child, and he strongly defends him as well, saying that they were never alone together, he never spent the night, but I, I read that he did spend the night once, but that's a whole other story. I'm still not ready for Michael. A.J. McLean's mother, Denise, said, As a mother, you kind of put two and two together. Yet, there was always that fine line where you sat back and went, Okay, is this a guy who wanted to be a father or an uncle? Is this all innocent, or is it more? I kind of thought that there might have been something strange going on, but you just didn't know. Ashley Parker Angel from LFO talked about an incident where Luke called him to his room to, quote, talk about his performance. And against the advice of others, he went. Lou started telling him things like, you're the next Justin Timberlake or the next Nick Carter, but you've got to stay in shape. And then he'd take it a step further and say, I minored in physical therapy in college. I can give your muscles a pump without you even working out. Let me rub your muscles. And then it suddenly became a strange massage and Ashley started to realize what was going on. All of a sudden, the phone rang, and Ashley got the hell out of there. He says that that's the most that ever occurred between him and Lou. The way he talks about Lou in this documentary, it's like he is so creeped out by this man. Another guy named Tim Christopher, he was in the band Take 5, which he joined at 13. He remembers a sleepover where he and another boy were dozing off, and Lou all of a sudden appeared at the foot of their bed wearing only a towel. Lou performed a swan dive on the bed, even though they're, like, falling asleep, and he started wrestling with the boys, at which point his towel came off. And the boys were just like, oh, Lou, that's gross. Christopher recalls, what did I know? I was 13. On a separate occasion, Christopher and another, um, another band member called up Lou to tell him, hey, we're going to come over and play some pool. When they arrived, Lou opened the door completely naked, explaining that he was just getting out of the shower. Christopher also recalls being shown footage of the Innocence Girl sunbathing topless and also an incident where the guys were all watching Star Wars and Lou suddenly switched it to a porno. Christopher says that at the time, they just thought it was funny. He said, we were kids. We were like, great. His mother, Stephanie, said, no one ever complained. Most of the stuff we learned about only after the group broke up in 2011. Lou played this game of trying to alienate the parents. Every time he dropped the boys off, it was, don't tell the parents everything. They pretty much had a pact with him, and they kept it. Two of the guys in Take 5 were brothers, and their mother found out that Lou had taken one of her sons to a strip club. She says, Did Lou rape my boys? No, he didn't. But he put them and a lot of others in inappropriate situations. I know that. To me, the man is just a sexual predator. This kind of behavior is a perfect example of grooming, by the way. He's constantly trying to be one of the kids and make them comfortable around him, while simultaneously being the cool adult who lets them watch porn and go to strip clubs. He confuses these kids by behaving like a peer while gradually teaching the boys to become comfortable becoming aroused around him. It's a process. One minute they're watching Star Wars, the next minute they're watching porn and wrestling, and then going to strip clubs. Among the few people who will discuss Perman's behavior in detail is one of his former assistants named Steve Mooney. In 1998, Mooney was 20 years old, he was handsome, had flowing blonde hair, and he was trying to get started as a singer when he was approached at a mall where he was working at Abercrombie and Fitch. He was invited to audition for Perlman, but instead of a singing job, Perlman offered him a job as his personal assistant, explaining that J.C. Chazé of NSYNC had gotten his start the same way. I don't, I don't think that's true, by the way. Mooney took the job, and Lou invited him to come live in his home with him. The whole time, Lou was implying to Mooney that he could join the band O-Town. According to Mooney, Lou told him, by this time next year, you'll be a millionaire. Right away, Mooney noticed that Lou enjoyed hugging him, rubbing his shoulders, squeezing his arms and his muscles, and it was usually in conjunction with one of his little pep talks where he would say, do you trust me? I want to break you down and then build you up so we can be a team together. 
And then he'd say, your aura's off. We've, we've got to get your aura aligned. And he'd start rubbing their shoulders. And Mooney would be like, whoa. And he'd be like, no, no, it's, it's all right. We've got to fix your aura. Mooney says that it got to the point where every time they were alone, Lou would rub his muscles. He said, as soon as the elevator doors close, he would grab you and rub your abs. The first few times, it's okay, but it gets to be too much. It's like you have this creepy friend who's always touching you. Rich Cronin said, that was the line, the aura. I definitely heard that aura bullshit. It took everything in me not to laugh. He was like, I know some mystical freaking ancient massage technique that if I massage you and we bond in a certain way through these special massages, it will strengthen your aura to the point that you were irresistible to people. Cronin continues, I swear to God, I had to bite my cheeks to stop from laughing. I mean, I now know what it's like to be a chick. He was so touchy feeling, always grabbing your shoulders, touching you, rubbing your abs. It was so obvious and disgusting. He definitely came at people. He came at me. In my situation, I avoided him like the plague. If I went to his house, I went with somebody. I would never go with him alone because I knew every time I was over there by myself, it always led to some weird situation. Like he'd call late at night to come over and talk about a tour and you'd get there and he'd be sitting there in boxers. The guy was hairy as a bear. Steve Mooney shared his concerns with his father and the three of them decided to go out to dinner together. While they ate, Perlman kept putting his hand on Mooney's leg. Finally, Mooney asked him to stop, and afterwards, he was shocked when his father said that Perlman seemed okay. Mooney says, It's weird, but when you start talking about money and fame, it's like Lou's got this mind control over people. Mooney recalls a conversation he had with a singer in uh, a second-tier Lou Perlman band, and Mooney asked him, Does he ever grope you? And he said, Yeah, all the time. He told him that Lou once grabbed him down there. So Mooney said, Well, what do you do about it? The guy said, Look, If the guy wants to massage me and I'm getting a million dollars for it, you just go along with it. It's the price you gotta pay. While living at Lou Pearlman's home, Steve Mooney believed that he saw firsthand the price many young men were paying. Lou's bedroom had double doors, and more than once, Mooney encountered young male singers slipping out the doors late at night, tucking in their shirts with a sheepish look on their faces. He says, There was one guy in every band, one sacrifice, one guy in every band who takes it for Lou. That's just the way it was. Mooney says that matters came to a head in 2000 during the final stages of the O-Town selection process. Lou was discussing the selection process with Phoenix Stone, who is another performer who, um, he worked with Lou in Transcontinental. So Phoenix is over at Lou's house and they're talking, and all of a sudden Lou decided to call up Mooney and told him, I need somebody to come take out the garbage. Phoenix says, it was very clear to me what was going on. I stopped it right then and there. When Lou called Steve, they had an argument. Steve got very mad, saying, I'm not coming over. So I said to Perlman, if it's about the garbage, there's plenty of people who can take out your garbage. If it's not, we'll just leave the kid alone. It's late. So Phoenix left, thinking that that was the end of that. But after he left, apparently, Lou called Mooney back, and he insisted that he come to his mansion at 2 in the morning. When Mooney got there, he found Lou in his office wearing a white terry cloth bathrobe. They had a long argument, and Mooney finally demanded, what do I have to do to get in this band? Lou smiled. He leaned back in his chair, spread his legs, and said, You're a smart boy. Figure it out. It is important to note that this is a very sensitive topic among the former band members. There's only been a few statements here and there, and nobody really admitting to anything. In the, For every person who says that they experienced something or saw something inappropriate, there are two who won't discuss it, and three more who deny hearing anything but rumors. One attorney said, None of these kids will ever admit anything happened. They're all too ashamed. And if the truth comes out, it would ruin their careers. And there was something I forgot to say. So Nikki DeLoach, she was from the band Innocence. She says that when it was time for her to sign her release contract, she refused to sign it because there was a clause in it that said that she couldn't talk about any of her experiences with Lou Pearlman. She refused to sign it, saying she was going to tell people the truth. Lou responded by reminding her that he actually took out an insurance policy out on her. So... Like, say if something were to happen to her on a flight or something, Lou could literally profit off of her death. Lou expanded his company, Transcontinental, into numerous other businesses, many of which expanded beyond music. He purchased Chippendales, TCBY Yogurt, and on and on, and the company kind of grew into, like, a global entity. He also purchased an internet-based talent agency called Options Talent, which was already under investigation for fraudulent activity when he bought it. So that was fucking stupid. The company was believed to be scamming people. They were like approaching people in shopping malls and stuff, telling them that they could be models. And they'd be like, I'll set you up with a photographer. You need to get these headshots. 
And then the person would spend all their money on pictures and nothing would ever come from it. So a lot of people started filing consumer complaints and an investigation began. The FBI started showing up to question Lou, like in the middle of their business meetings. But strangely, somewhere along this investigation, a new attorney general came into the picture. His name was Charlie Crist. Lou was a supporter of Chris's campaign, so Chris was the beneficiary of some of Lou's contributions, either in cash or services. Suddenly, the investigation was dropped. Just like that. Poof. And Charlie Crist went on to become a U.S. congressman. Meanwhile, a lot of people were investing money into transcontinental airlines and seeing none of the money that they were promised. And this included just, like, helpless elderly people who didn't even have a way of coming up with new money. They were, like, using up all their savings to invest. So they tried to contact Perlman, but he was completely unreachable. There were multiple investors who only owned tiny lots of Transcon Air stock. Lou told the people that the majority of the stock was controlled by a guy named Theodore Wollenkemper. There was only one person who was able to buy a significant stake in the company, about 7%, and his name was Julian Bencher. So in the late 90s, Bencher complained to Lou that he wasn't receiving his dividends on his stock. So Lou blamed Wollenkemper, saying that he was just refusing to pay out. Bencher actually flew to Germany in November 1998 to get answers from Wollenkemper. So Bencher confronts Wollenkemper, and Wollenkemper's like, what are you talking about? Bencher's like, Transcon Airlines. And Wollenkemper's like, what's Transcontinental Airlines got to do with me? Bencher says, you own it. You own 82% of it. Wollenkemper starts laughing. So Bencher's like, Transcon Air, 49 airplanes. And Wollenkemper's like, I have planes, but not this Transcon Air. Julian, this has nothing to do with me. The truth was, there was no Transcon Airlines. Bencher was stunned, so he started to investigate how many airplanes Perlman actually owned. He found precisely three, and all of them appeared to not even belong to Transcon Air, but to a small charter service that Lou had formed in 1998. Bencher says, Transcon Airlines only existed on paper, but it was always so believable. There was always a plane or helicopter there whenever he wanted. When we flew to LA on MGM Grand Air, Lou said the jet was one of his. When he said he owned the plane, well, how could you tell he didn't? Bencher ended up striking a settlement agreement with Lou where he promised not to publicly disparage him, and he's never revealed any of his findings up until now. Lou also had brochures for Transcon Air that featured a picture of a massive 747 landing at what appeared to be New York's LaGuardia Airport, and he was showing these brochures to investors for years. Well, here's what's funny. The planes in the pictures aren't real planes. It's actually, like, a model plane that his friend built. Like... Lou literally took the model plane to LaGuardia Airport and parked outside and then held it up in the air and then took a picture to make it look like it was taking off. And he was able to fool all these people into thinking that it was an actual 747. So since the 1980s, Lou Perlman was taking people's money under the guise of investing it into businesses that didn't really exist. And then he took that money and used it to create the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. And then he used them to tell people, look what I can do with your money. Give me more. And then people would invest in the boy bands, believing that they actually own stock in these bands. Like he would tell people, now you own part of the Backstreet Boys. Essentially, he used the boy bands to continue scamming people. So then he uses his new money to pay back old investors. But as people start asking for their money back, he is not able to catch up. He was also taking out big loans with banks, which was funny because he, he didn't have money. But he was able to convince the banks that he did. He ended up owing investors something like $250 million and the banks another $250 million. So the overall debt was about half a billion dollars. Sadly, almost all of the victims lost all of their investment funds. So like I said, all of these investors, a lot of them were just regular people and they were at a loss. So a lot of them started writing to this financial writer named Helen Huntley. And she just received letter after letter after call after call about Lou Pearlman and Transcontinental Airlines. They sent her all of their paperwork, and she could tell right away that there was something fishy happening. Finally, a lawyer sued Perlman, and the judge ordered him to pay $16.5 million. He arranged a bank transfer from an account in Munich, Germany, and the money never arrived. With everything crumbling around him, Lou fled. He disappeared, and nobody could find him. So the FBI and everybody's looking for him, and then suddenly, Helen Huntley received an email saying that somebody spotted him in Bali. This guy was just on vacation with his wife in Bali, and he happened to see Lou Pearlman. So the FBI is kind of like, eh, you know, we don't even know if this is a real lead, but we'll go. We'll go check it out. So they don't even know where to look, but they go to Bali, and they just, like, they're like, let's go to breakfast. So they go to a restaurant, and coincidentally, Lou was at the same restaurant eating breakfast. So the FBI arrested Lou Pearlman in Bali in 2007. 
Lou ended up pleading guilty to one conspiracy to his investment fraud scheme and to commit mail fraud and wire fraud, and a second conspiracy related to his bank fraud scheme. He also pleaded guilty to money laundering and to committing bankruptcy fraud while on the run. In 2008, Lou Pearlman was sentenced to the maximum of 25 years in prison, which was one of the longest in a fraud case. Lou had all of these ideas to come up with money from jail. If they would just give him access to phones or the internet, he could start a new band and pay all the money back. Of course, that didn't happen. In 2010, just two years into his sentence, Lou Pearlman had a stroke and died behind bars. And that's the story of Lou Pearlman. Most of the bands that worked with Lou Pearlman did end up suing him at the end of the day. I have a lot of sympathy for the people in these bands because, I mean, for the most part, they were teenagers. Not just teenagers. I mean, some of them were young adults, but still, they're not well-versed in this industry. It was sad. That's it for today. Thank you again for listening. Don't forget, you can always go to BrokenLimelight.com to get more information about the episode. There's um, something in between show notes and a transcript up there, as well as some videos and some pictures. I like to include, like, interview clips up there. Before we wrap up, I want to make a couple of announcements. First of all, my new book is out. It's called Broken Limelight, Shocking True Crime Stories About Celebrities. It is on Amazon. You can buy it now. And I'm also hosting a book signing on October 2nd. It'll be here in Las Vegas, Nevada. So if you want more information about that, just head over to BrokenLimelight.com, and all the details are there as well. I would love to meet you guys, so... Come on down, get a book, get it signed, take a picture with me. It'll be fun. If you guys aren't following me on social media, please go give me a follow on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I really need more YouTube subscribers, guys, so <laughs> help me out there, please. Um, also, while you're at it, I have a friend on YouTube. Actually, she is a YouTuber who became my friend. <laughs> Her name is Diva Divine Light, and she covers the R. Kelly case in depth. She has been following the trial as of late. And one of these days, she invited me on her show to do kind of like a mock trial. Like, a few of us read different parts from the court transcript, and it was pretty cool. So, I absolutely recommend that you check that channel out and give her a subscribe as well. That's pretty much it. Uh, don't forget, I might be taking a short break from the podcast. Give me a couple weeks to come back, all rested and fresh for the spooky season, alright? Thank you guys so, so much for your support. Bye! Bark box! Bark box! Bark box! Bark Box. You guys know my dogs, Jude and Eleanor Rigby. Well, we just started getting in Bark Box, and I'm telling you, your dogs will love you. No more are they angry at the mailman. No more, I say. It's like a box of dog joy that's delivered every month, and each box tells a different story with different themed toys, treats, and photo-worthy props. Typically, what we get in each box is a couple of toys, a couple of treats, and a chew, but you can actually tailor fit your box to fit your dog's needs. Guys, I'm telling you, your dogs will love you, even more than they already do. So try it out, and if you use my link, you'll get a free extra month of BarkBox, which is a $35 value. So just head to BarkBox.com slash Broken Limelight and get started on your first BarkBox today. BarkBox! 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 Nailed it, Jude.